friends, and welcome to this episode of My Heroes Headquarters. Today, we get to feature a wonderful clinician-patient relationship, highlighting the importance of a patient's trust in his oncologist and the great lengths the oncologist will go to ensure best outcomes for her patient. Dr. Jennifer Spratlin is an outstanding Edmonton-based medical oncologist who has been treating John Simmons, a young onset stage four colon cancer patient in a very open, calm and reassuring manner. John has been undergoing his journey with perseverance and great determination with the support of his family and friends and has to date been thriving in living his life with great joy and purpose. Sit back and listen to this inspiring story as we highlight our true everyday heroes. A story moderated by Mr. Ryan Clark from Eversana, Canada. Thanks very much, my friends. Dr. Jennifer Spratlin is an associate professor in the Department of Oncology at the University of Alberta and a medical oncologist at the Cross Cancer Institute with Alberta Health Services. She, she is an active member and principal investigator in the gastrointestinal and investigational new drugs groups at the Cross and is the current GI tumor group lead at the institution. Dr. Spratlin is also a collaborator with WellDoc Alberta with an interest in physician wellness and is a valued member of CRAN's Medical and Scientific Advisory Board. In October, 2021, John Simmons was diagnosed with colorectal cancer after a colonoscopy discovered a mass which arose in the cecum with a direct extension into the ileocecal valve, uh, mesentery appendix and mesoappendix. This diagnosis occurred despite the absence of any blood in his stool or any other symptoms normally consistent with colorectal cancer. John underwent an initial surgery. Later, a scan revealed liver metastases, leading to a second surgery in December, 2021. So Dr. Spratlin, let me start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your practice and um, the, uh, the kind of support that you provide to your patients as they go through their journey? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, um, Ryan and, and Philomena. I'm really pleased to be able to participate in this. Um, so I'm a gastroenterology or gastrointestinal medical oncologist. Um, that's most of my practice. So I, I treat cancers that arise pretty much anywhere in the gut, including the esophagus, stomach, pancreas, liver, and bowel. Um, the, the other part of my practice is, is as a phase one clinical trialist. So I also investigate uh, new drugs that are coming into um, practice, um, but very early on. Um, so I, I met John several months ago and um, I, I saw him for his initial consultation. And my job really is to try to, I think, help make patients um, be able to make the best decision for themselves with regards to what treatment uh, we will choose to use in their particular instance and provide as much information as I can about um, the treatments and the options as well as the side effects. Uh, and then once we make a decision together on, on what the best move is for that particular patient, we go ahead and start treatment. And during that time, I think my, my biggest role is to support them through uh, the treatment and the side effects and um, just any questions that they might have with regards to their cancer and where things are going. And um, I think a part of my job that I really take to heart is, is just really trying to deal with the anxieties that naturally come up when people are diagnosed with uh, cancers and, and try to just normalize those for my patients. So John, uh, welcome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, about your story? Uh, I gave a, a, a summary, a quick summary, but maybe you could tell us a little bit more um, about what you've experienced. Yeah, so I guess for me, the, um, the starting point for this was uh, an, uh, anemia. Um, in the late summer, early fall, 2021, felt a huge drop in my energy levels. And I attributed this to, um, I had had a son at the end of March that year, 
my first child <laughs> um, and I was a little bit out of shape. So I just kept, you know, excusing the low energy because I was sleep deprived. And um, throughout September, I started to notice um, increased constipation. And I attributed this to the iron supplement that I was uh, was taking because the a doctor did warn me that an iron supplement could cause constipation. So that's what I associated it with. And the constipation turned into um, pain. So on October 21st, late in the evening, while I was hanging out with my son, I had, uh, I would say, the, the worst pain um, of my life in, in my my right side. And that led to an ER visit. And uh, initially they thought it was uh, kidney stones and then gallstones. Um, you know, this is while I'm on the gurney <laughs> being flushed with pain medication. Um, and then finally they settled on, oh, it's probably your appendix. Um, so I went in, uh, you know, expecting to have appendicitis and have my appendix removed. And that was the setup. But the the doctor that I was seeing at the time said, uh, well, let's do a colonoscopy just in case, because I had been scheduled for a colonoscopy earlier to try and address the anemia. And that ended up getting canceled. Um, so let's just do a colonoscopy. So um, I did the colonoscopy. And um, as I was coming out of the anesthesia, um, the doctor told me uh, that I, it was probably cancer. Um, and that is what sort of started the whole journey for me, the, the mass and the cecum, and then the eventual removal of the appendix so that did come out too. <laughs> so, you know, at least one of those things that I had initially was, uh, was being addressed. Um, so that's my story. And then later on, um, I found out that it spread to the, uh, to the liver. So I had liver mets. And I underwent surgery for that. And then fairly quickly, I started seeing, after that, started seeing uh, Dr. Spratlin. So um, thank you, John. Uh, Dr. Spratlin, uh, back to you. Can, you. can you walk us through perhaps the sort of the interventions that John has received since coming to you right up until sort of today kind of thing? Sure. And please, John, jump in if uh, I kind of miss anything. So John uh, came to me, as, as he mentioned, after uh, uh, what was uh, and is hoped to be a curative uh, resection. Um, so he had his main tumor cut out of his colon. Um, and he also had some uh, liver metastases cut out. And that is the usual process when, when we know that uh, colorectal cancer has spread and it's still in quotation marks, cut outable, or a surgeon thinks that they can resect all of the cancer, they, they would generally first go for that surgical resection, either through one or more surgeries prior to seeing somebody like myself. And so John had done that with his colon surgery, and then the liver surgery. And he had had a little bit of time to heal up. Uh, and then uh, post liver surgery, he came to me to talk about what we might be able to do to try to improve his chance of cure. So very important when we, when I see somebody or someone like me sees a patient uh, to try to distinguish for them off the bat, really, are, are we on a curative path, meaning we're still trying to ensure that this cancer does not um, return and, and eventually cause death, or is it not curable? And in John's particular case, because a surgeon thought that they could get everything that they could see on CT scan and through the surgery, he was still on a curative path. And so we sat down, him and his wife and I, uh, to discuss what potential treatments were possible to try to improve that chance. And um, in spread colon cancer that has been cut out, really the, the only extra that we can add on is chemotherapy. Um, and the current standard of care worldwide is about six months uh, worth of treatment. Um, and that could be anything from a single agent oral tablet called capecitabine. Uh, for six months to combination chemotherapy, all of which can be delivered through a special intravenous called a port, or it could be a combination of that same capecitabine pill and an intravenous that we can give through his arm. Uh, and, and so we went through the pros and cons of, of those 
particular options with him. And we discussed the, the benefits and risks and how much extra benefit we might get if we used more than one drug. Uh, and then we, we kind of just walked through his questions and came to a decision of, on what was best for him. And, um, and what, was, what was the decision, just so we're clear sort of thing? So we went on to use the what we call Capox or Capecitabine plus oxaliplatin for him, uh, avoiding the need for a, a central line or an intravenous line. Uh, and it, it's the combination of both pills and an intravenous chemotherapy together. So John, um, uh, obviously we've talked about your treatment and that kind of thing. Uh, tell us a little bit more about sort of psychologically, emotionally, what has this what has this journey been like for you and your and your family? Uh, well, the the impact on the family was um, uh, hugely significant. I mean, we had a small child. Um, we have a very small family. Um, we have some supports, but um, not a ton. So a lot of the stress, the anxiety, the worry, it fell on my wife's shoulders, um, unfortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, she was a superstar throughout that entire process, um, freeing me up, I guess, to really focus on getting through the surgeries and, and the next steps. And, and, and also she was my pipeline to, um, to Cran, you know, following those surgeries and informing me about what's going on, educating me about what's going on, <laughs> educating me about my own disease <laughs> to, to a certain extent, um, because I just didn't have the, uh, the capacity um, during, during that period, like, primarily because of fatigue. Um, in terms of the psychological impact on me, I think the the general sense, if, if, if you talk to my wife and, and my family and friends, is that I handled the whole thing fairly well. Um, I would say that um, I tend towards kind of a the stoic end of the spectrum when dealing with crises. Um, though I did have a, a dark period, I think during the um, during the first the first surgery because you know it felt a little bit like going to a car mechanic and you're expecting an oil change and then this problem emerges and then that problem emerges and it's like well I. I have to, I have to get it done. Like there's nothing else I can do. So I felt a lot of the, any kind of anxiety and depression I had about the illness was tied to the fact that I had so little control over anything. I was just kind of on the rails and um, there's a certain distance that the, the hospital staff have with, with the patient. I mean, and again, going back to the, the car mechanic analogy, it's like, here's a problem. Here's It's very data-driven, which I appreciate. Um, but I felt like I had no sense of myself during the process, the early part of the process. I was just kind of a on a slab, uh, essentially, while people were doing things around me. Um, so that was the biggest aspect. But once I kind of framed this, you know, um, I framed, I had to frame it differently. You know what I was, I was doing things to increase my chances of, um, curability. Um, and I just had, I had to do that and I had to accept some of the psychological and emotional consequences that were associated with that. And I think once I got on to that new framework, um, I was, I was more or less fine. Um, and I, I think going back to Jennifer's point, educating myself, um, you know, more, the more information I had, the, even if that information wasn't what I wanted to hear, it made me feel, um, it made me feel better about the entire process. Cause I felt like, okay, I, I know what I'm doing. I know why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. And it, it gave me a sense of a, a little bit of control over my situation. And of course, working with Jennifer, um, she gave me a choice for the first time. <laughs> during this entire process like and you know giving me a sense of what the benefits were and the risks of certain treatment plans up until that point no one had, there was no choice involved at all you know it was kind of paint by numbers um and that was also hugely impactful for my for my mental health and obviously you've touched on you've touched on cran as as well did you want to add anything in terms of the role that 
Cran played with you and, and your wife through, through this journey? Yeah. Cran, um, you know, the, the website primarily, I mean, outside of our conversations with Philomena and, you know, Philomena also educated us and, and dealt with our silly questions and our, and our anxieties. And so she took the, she took the brunt of that for sure. But then just browsing the website and um, getting a better understanding of my cancer, the risk factors, the treatment options, and then later on um, the nutritional um, component, because I had a lot of questions about what should I be eating? What should I be drinking? I knew the basics. I shouldn't smoke and I should limit alcohol consumption and, um, you know, processed, processed foods. Um, but beyond that, you know, if we're trying to optimize and, you know, I have a little bit of a tendency to want to optimize things a little bit, like what could I do? What's actually evidence backed and having a resource on, on that front where I can actually check it, um, was, uh, was huge because there's a lot of, I mean, let's be frank, there's a lot of pseudoscience, there's a lot of pseudomedicine out there. There's a lot of information that is anecdotal. It's not evidence-backed. And um, having one resource hub where I could see the latest stuff grounded in actual research. I mean, for me, my personality type, that was huge. Can I just touch on a couple of things that John mentioned? Because I think it's so important. And it's I think it's also something that we don't talk enough about in, in medicine uh, and for our patients is the fact that, you know, John's a young, he thought he was a young, healthy guy going through life, starting a family, right? And then snap of a finger, his life changes because of some belly pain and how um, difficult that is for it, how difficult it would be for anybody and, and how anxiety provoking that uh, would feel because you are left in a situation where everything for those moments and, and those weeks, um, sometimes longer, is, is really out of your control. And, and for John, it's not dissimilar to a lot of the patients that I see. You know, you go into hospital, like you said, you think you're getting an oil change. Well, holy smokes, you need a whole new engine, right? And um, not having control over that and having to um, relinquish um, your, a lot of your decisions to putting trust in the healthcare team that's involved in your care and um, just going through the motions and the steps of what needs to be done. Right. And it's not uncommon either that our patients come to us and, and say, Holy, I, I didn't know what was going on. And, and I think because just the nature of the healthcare system for him, he, it needed to be done. You know, he needed that surgery and, and they needed to make decisions while he was on the table. And then, and then they found out about the liver mets and he has to go for that surgery and heal up from that before he gets some of the answers that he was really looking for when he finally got to the cancer center. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really a hard thing for people to deal with. And I, I think we need to be better at normalizing and just saying this is hard. And, and sometimes we don't have all of the answers right away, but we're going to do the best that we can to get those answers over time. Um, I, I think just, just letting patients know that um, is just a huge thing. And the other thing that I wanted to touch on is the fact that John has um, uh, just the most wonderful support in his wife, right? Marina was, was there doing the thinking behind the scenes when John just had to be doing the doing, right? right. He, he had to just get through the surgery and then the next surgery and healing up and, and, and even through his chemotherapy, um, Sometimes it's just hard enough for people to get through a day if they're feeling super tired from the, the side effects of the chemotherapy or they're having some nausea or vomiting or a little, you know, diarrhea, things that the chemo can do. Some, sometimes people just have to do it one day at a time and they can't do anything other than just be in that moment and get through it. And the fact that Marina was there for John to be able to help with some of the research and ask the questions and connect with Cran is so invaluable. Um, I mean, I don't think that our caregivers and partners and family members get enough credit for, for being there to hold our patients' hands. Um, and some people don't have that, you know, and, and that becomes so hard when you don't even, when you don't have that support. So just recognizing that and, and um, you know, saying out loud, thank you um, for, for our patients, family members who are able to be there for them because I can't be right. I can't be at home with, with John to help him. Um, I think it's just really crucial. 
So John, uh, we'll give the last word uh, to you. Uh, we've touched on a lot of points today, but is there anything that you'd like to leave um, the viewers with in terms of uh, sort of piece of guidance, a piece of advice, perhaps somebody as well who's just maybe starting out on on their journey uh, that you'd like to that you'd like to mention in closing. Um, I think the, the 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 big thing, I mean, outside of what we've already discussed, which is having an advocate, um, and then um, making sure that you have a good relationship with your um, your oncologist and that you're comfortable with them, which which I was, and that you're getting your your questions answered. Um, I think, you know, really spending time um, looking for educational resources, facing um, facing the fear around statistics. You know, someone says stage four, people immediately kind of, they have that visceral emotional response. Um, you, I feel like you really have to kind of work through that to get to the next step and and Cran was hugely beneficial um, in that regard. And, and, you know, Philomena was the first person to actually um, frame my situation as good, um, relatively speaking. You know, it's the it, it, obviously being stage four is not good, but um, my circumstances, no one had given me that kind of zoomed out broader view of my circumstances. And because you end up getting lost in the minutia, the the details of treatment and, and surgery and, re, and recovery, and you don't really think about what your trajectory is, it's certainly not relative to anybody else, because by the nature of what you're dealing with, you kind of become a little bit self-absorbed. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but you become very kind of me-focused as you're going through these things. And um, having someone actually kind of pat you on the back and, and say, you know, you have a chance here, a positive chance. Um, and there's a lot of, you have a lot of things going for you. And then Dr. Spratt, and then the first person to use the word curative in, in my context. Um, these things are, are really important. So finding those resources, um, if you can, if you have them available to you, um, is huge. And then I think the final closing thought is be careful about what you read on the internet. Uh, <laughs> Because there, there is any kind of illness, any kind of health-related sort of problem. There is a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of anecdotes being shared around treatment modalities, um, symptoms, how to address those symptoms. I really tried to stay as focused as possible on the the science and research-backed resources that I had available to me, and and, and Cram provided that. Very good. Well said. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Spratlin. Really appreciate uh, your participation today. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.